What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be brewing up a beer that I have not actually made here on the channel in about three years. Uh, no particular reason whatsoever behind that, it's just it's something I never got around to. And that beer is a robust porter, an American porter. It's a very popular beer, a very classic style of beer. But recently you guys said you wanted to see more dark beers on this channel, and I hear you. So we are going to be making more dark beers, starting with this robust porter. So what is a robust porter? It's also known as an American porter, and it's, a, as I said, a very popular beer style nowadays, but it was also a very popular beer style about 300 years ago. Porter really came about back in the 1700s and early 1800s. The original porter is actually the London porter, uh, which is just a really historical style of beer. It was actually initially a blend of three different kinds of beers called an entire, and uh, was actually preferred by the dock workers who were known as porters back in the day. Um, and that's how it initially got its name. So as that beer got that moniker of porter and grew in popularity, it began to be brewed more in a dedicated fashion. It would actually begin to get made with these roasted malts and then brand new black patent malt, which was a drum roasted malt, um, which was actually a relatively new technique for the time. Using that black patent malt led to this really strong roasty flavor and character that we all kind of associate with these types of beers. But also, because of the influence of the British Empire, the porter began to make its way all around the world. Porter also evolved over time, and an offshoot of porter known as a stout porter eventually evolved into stouts themselves as we know them today um, but most notably Guinness Irish stout was uh, originally known as a stout porter. There's plenty of variations on the porter style nowadays. We have the Baltic porter, the pre-prohibition porter, the American or robust porter, and of course the many variations of stouts nowadays that are available as well. But today we're focusing on that robust slash American Porter. Because of a little thing that happened in the early 20th century called Prohibition, we here in the United States lost most of the European influenced beer styles that were readily available to everyone. And unfortunately, Porter was one of those things, which is why we have a category now known as Pre-Prohibition Porter. That's not what we're making today though. The American Porter is actually a relatively new uh, kind of subcategory within Porter itself. And it actually came about back in the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s when the craft beer revolution was starting to take off in the United States. There was a sort of renaissance of the Porter. Uh, it started getting made again, but it started getting made in the West Coast style. It was a higher alcohol version of the beer. It had more hops and bitterness in it and a little more aggressive and assertive roastiness in it as well. And it was enough of a difference in style to become its own thing eventually. And that's a pretty good descriptor of the beer we're targeting today. Something that's in the mid six to 7% ABV range has a good amount of roastiness, not as much as a stout, but still plenty to be reckoned with and a fair amount of hop bitterness in there as well. This is gonna be a beer that finishes at a relatively high final gravity, but that's not something you would initially guess based on the balance of that beer. So we're throwing in like 35 IBUs of hops in this thing, but you wouldn't necessarily guess that. This beer will certainly need to age a little bit, uh, but because of some techniques I'm gonna be using today, we're actually gonna accelerate that process a little bit and have it on tap and ready to go a little bit quicker. Before we jump into the recipe though, I do wanna thank a few organizations for helping make this video possible. First of all, Northern Brewer. They sent me all the ingredients that I needed to make this batch of beer, and so therefore you can find all of the ingredients to make this batch of beer on their website as well if you want to follow this recipe. They are a great place to shop for ingredients and equipment. Secondly, Clawhammer Supply, who manufactured the system that I've been brewing on for the last about two years or so now. They have both 120 and 240 volt, both 10 and 20 gallon systems available to you uh, for your various electric brewing needs. Go check them out. Also check out their YouTube channel as well. So we're gonna start out with about 10 pounds of Simpsons Maris Otter Base Malt. This is a really good base malt for these darker and maltier beers. Maris Otter has a really nice biscuity kind of quality to it and fullness to it, chewiness almost, that gives these, uh, these darker maltier beers a little bit more substantial substantial complexity uh, than just any other kind of base malt. Uh, it really does help tie things together and it's one of my favorite base malts to use. We're gonna add to that a pound and a half of Munich malt. That's gonna lend kind of a bready middle ground there. It's gonna help bridge the gap between the base malt and the specialty malts that we're gonna be adding to this beer. 
And speaking of specialty malts, we're gonna add one pound of Simpson's English Medium Crystal. This is about a 90 Laufabon crystal malt um, that is from the UK. Trust me, English crystal malts are far better and more complex than your standard basic 20, 40, 60, 80 Laufabon crystal malts that you might find here from various large maltsters. They are traditional in English brewing, and for styles like Porter, it's kind of important to have a little bit of something in there to get that final gravity up to give you that full body and that residual sweetness. And then lastly, we're gonna add two types of roasted malts here. Typically, the rule of thumb is in a beer like a porter, you don't wanna add any more than three different kinds of dark roasted malts, and you're typically gonna see an addition of either chocolate malt or brown malt in porter brewing. We're just gonna stick with chocolate malt and a dark roasted malt known as midnight wheat. I'm gonna be adding in half a pound of each, English chocolate malt and midnight wheat. The reason for the midnight wheat is actually that it's a huskless grain which cuts down on that level of bitter astringency that you can get from using too much roasted barley and roasted barley malts like chocolate malt. Um, and we're also going to be adding both of these dark roasted grains in the last 15 minutes of the mash which is another technique you can use to get that color and to get most of that roasty flavor but without leaving it in the mash so long that it contributes astringency and harshness. By doing that, you significantly cut down on the aging period required for these beers to really reach their maximum potential. So, this porter probably will actually be ready in about maybe two or three weeks as opposed to two or three months. For the hops on this beer, we're gonna be adding in uh, 35 IBUs of hops. We're gonna be bittering with nugget, and I'm gonna add in three quarters of an ounce of nugget at 60 minutes for that. So we'll be adding one ounce of Willamette at 10 minutes for an overall aroma addition. So even though I use mostly English malts and I'll be using an English yeast uh, for this style, having those American hops in there to get you that more aggressive, assertive bitterness is important for this type of beer. That extra bitterness is really gonna help balance out the sweetness that you're gonna get from that English crystal malt, which having those two flavors in there but still balanced really gives this beer a lot of complexity and flavor and that signature American porter style. So for the water profile on this one, I'm really targeting something that's gonna be a balanced profile. Uh, so relatively equal amounts of chloride and sulfates. But what is really important here is boosting that bicarbonate level to help keep our pH in line. Um, so the pH of the beer is gonna be significantly affected by roasted malts, even though that's only coming in at the very end of the mash. So I don't need to necessarily add a ton of bicarbonates, but still, with these darker base malts, with that Munich malt, with that crystal malt as well, going in for the full duration of the mash, it's, it's okay to have some bicarbonates in there. It's also gonna help affect the mouthfeel of the beer as well though, and it's gonna have that classic porter character. So the water profile I'm targeting is 51 parts per million of calcium seven parts per million of magnesium, 36 parts per million of sodium, 63 parts per million of chloride, 62 parts per million of sulfate, and 94 parts per million of bicarbonate. And in order to get that water profile, I'm starting out with eight gallons of spring water, uh, because spring water has a little bit of that residual uh, mineral character in it and some residual bicarbonates as well to kind of boost on this. It's also readily available and comes in large four gallon bottles. But I'm adding to those eight gallons of spring water, two grams of gypsum, two grams of Epsom, three grams of calcium chloride, and four grams of sodium bicarbonate or baking soda. And that's gonna help get us that water profile. We're gonna be using Lalamand London ESB for this particular brew. I'm using an English yeast in this one because I really do want to get that nice, round, malty English profile to the beer. It's gonna be bitter, it's gonna be roasty, it's gonna have that character, uh, which is enough to make it American. So if I use an American ale yeast in this one, I do run the risk of over attenuating in this beer, getting a lower than desired final gravity, which will seriously impact the drinkability of it because of that bitterness, because of that hop character and the roastiness. This, that could actually negatively impact how this beer drinks. So adding in that London ESB, the medium attenuating English yeast is gonna help ensure that this is actually quite a drinkable beer. And finally for the mash in this beer, we're gonna be doing a simple single infusion mash at 154 degrees Fahrenheit for 60 minutes. This temperature should be enough to get us a slightly higher final gravity, which when paired with that English yeast will give us probably something around, I hope, 1018 to 1020 uh, for a final gravity. 
giving us enough residual sweetness with still having a serious amount of alcohol in there and hopefully getting that balance perfect. I am very excited to make this beer. As I said, it's been so long since I've actually brewed a porter and I have come a very long way as a brewer since I last did. So I'm excited to see what I can do with this style. I added eight gallons of strike water to my claw hammer supply, 10 gallon, 240 volt system and started to heat it up towards that strike temperature. As the water was heating up, I measured out all my water salts and I added those into the strike water and I also milled out all of my grain with the exception of the dark roasted malts. That being the chocolate malt and the midnight wheat malt. Once the water had reached that strike temperature of 154 Fahrenheit, I mashed in with all of those aforementioned grains. I let the mash sit for about 10 minutes before measuring my pH. I saw that the pH was actually reasonably on target at 5.52, which uh, is actually decent measured at a hotter temperature. Since that was good to go, I went ahead and I crushed up the chocolate malt and the midnight wheat malt and set those aside. And once there was only 15 minutes left in the mash, then I added these in, stirred them up, and let the mash recirculate. This significantly darkened the color of the wort and allowed me to get that good color and roastiness without the acrid character. Once the mash had rested for a total of one hour, I raised it up to the mash out temperature of 170 Fahrenheit and let it sit there for 15 minutes before pulling out the grain basket entirely and letting it drain for another 15 minutes. As the grain basket was draining, I, as usual, heated up to a temperature slightly below boiling just to avoid a boil over but to get a head start of the process. Once we hit the boil, I went ahead and I added my bittering addition which was three quarters of an ounce of nugget. Then I let the boil continue for 50 more minutes. So 10 minutes from the end, I added one ounce of Willamette as well as a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient. Considering I'm submitting this beer to a competition, I wanted to brew as cleanly as possible, so that's why the Whirlflock tablet went in, despite this being a dark beer. Once the boil was complete, I initiated a whirlpool to pile up as much of that troube and hop debris in the center of the kettle as possible prior to chilling. I accomplished this by running the pump for about 3 minutes and then letting the whirlpool stand for 15 minutes before continuing the chilling process. In this particular brew, I tried out my new X Chillerator Counterflow Chiller, uh, and I was pleasantly surprised it performed about as well as the plate chiller did, although this time of year the water is very cold. I was still able to bring the wort down to pitching temperature in a single pass through the Counterflow Chiller. However, the biggest difference was a noticeably improved flow rate through the chiller. Before I pitched my yeast, I went ahead and collected an OG sample uh, and I was pleasantly surprised to find an above target gravity of 1068. This was above our target by two points. Once all the wort had been collected in the anvil bucket fermenter, I went ahead and rehydrated my Lalaman London ESB yeast and I pitched that into the fermenter and left it to ferment. So for the fermentation on this beer, uh, I am choosing to do this with an English yeast and that on its own brings in a few particulars that we have to pay attention to. The first is that we want to try and ferment this one on the low side of things. Um, I'm actually shooting for a fermentation temperature of about 65 degrees, slowly ramping it up to about 68 as it nears the end of fermentation. The reason for this is because English yeast really likes to throw a lot of berry and fruit esters, which can be complementary to the style sometimes but I don't necessarily want that in this porter. I feel like that would compete with the flavors that I'm trying to get out of chocolate and coffee. Now, also English yeast is very notorious for throwing out a lot of diacetyl, and I don't want that in the beer either. So that's why I'm raising that temperature up at the very end of the fermentation to help encourage the completion of fermentation and avoid having that diacetyl problem. Now, you can also ferment this beer with a classic American ale yeast. Like I said uh, at the beginning of this video though, be aware that it may over attenuate. And if you want to center this around using American Ale yeast, I would say maybe drop back your hop additions a little bit to a lower amount of IBUs, or try to mash at a higher temperature so that you get a little more residual sweetness or a little bit more um, unfermentable sugar that will help keep that yeast uh, 
from over fermenting and bringing it down to like 1010 or so. So we don't want that. The difference between American and English ale yeast is that English ale yeast is not capable of fermenting some of the more complex sugars out there, whereas American ale yeast is. Uh, so that's why you do get that lower final gravity sometimes if you swapped out say you're using SO4 and you swapped out USO5 instead. However, the trade-off there is that the English ale yeast is not as clean of a fermentation as the American ale yeast is and will leave a little bit of extra mouthfeel in the beer, which is also beneficial for this style. So I do highly recommend sticking with the English yeast on this one. Um, it does tend to make a little bit better of a beer, I think, even though classically you might want to make an American porter with American yeast. I do understand that. So a good option if you do want to stick with that American yeast is using the American Ale 2. You can find that strain in forms like Weiss 1272, WLP060, or Imperial Independence. But I still really do recommend fermenting this one with English yeast. But if you want to stick with dry for simplicity like I am, you can use that Lalaman ESB yeast, or you could go with Safail SO4. It's going to be nearly the same thing. Um, so those are two very easy to find English yeasts out there um, in the dry format. But when we're talking about dry yeast here, there's multiple English strains available. Um, and, and if we focus on Lalaman for a second here, we have Windsor, we have London, and we have Nottingham as, you know, the big three there. Those yeasts will perform very differently though in this beer. Windsor is going to be the least attenuating one of them all. You're going to get the most residual sweetness out of that yeast, so plan accordingly. London's going to be somewhere in the middle and Nottingham is going to burn that beer down. Nottingham can ferment those complex sugars and will ferment all the way down. Nottingham will behave a lot more like an American ale yeast, so keep that in mind as you're designing your recipe if you're going to use those. But I would recommend sticking with something in the middle that London ESB. You can get that in the form of Weiss 1968. Uh, WLP 013 and Imperial Pub is a good option from them. But you can also use one of the classic New England IPA strains like the Weiss 1318 London Ale 3 or uh, Imperial Conan or Imperial Barbarian. All of those are going to make really good British ales which include dark ales like this one. And something similar that might throw a little bit more ester um, but is still a reliable yeast to use is an Irish ale yeast. So it's going to be something like Weiss 1084, WLP 004 or Imperial Darkness. It's going to work just fine in the same capacity, similar to the London strains, um, but it might get a little bit more berry in there, so we'll see. Plenty of good options for this one. You could also ferment this one under pressure if you want to. It would work out pretty well, it's considering one of the main objectives here is to limit that berry ester, that fruit ester, so fermenting under pressure isn't going to be a bad idea. It's not a bad idea either, considering that the British yeasts do want to ferment that at a lower temperature, so push them under pressure, they might create fewer esters at a higher temperature. Not a bad idea. Um, I would not recommend using Kabaik for this one because it's going to attenuate quite a bit. Um, and that's going to get through some of those more complex sugars that you want to leave behind. However, I've never tried to use Kabaik with a porter style beer, so maybe somebody here has. Uh, and if that's the case, let me know. But just to recap and focus us, what I am doing here is pitching in my London ESB dry yeast. I'm going to ferment this one at 65 Fahrenheit, slowly ramp up to 68 over the course of about two weeks, maybe a bit longer depending on how it's behaving. And at that point, I'll go ahead and keg this thing. Um, once it is good to go, I'll leave it in the keg. Probably needs to condition at a cold temperature for another couple weeks or so to get that roundness, uh, to let that uh, aggressive, assertive bitterness kind of round itself out and become more drinkable. Hopefully it doesn't take too long to get ready and become a really nice, drinkable, smooth, roasted porter, but uh, we'll see. So hopefully I'll see you in a few weeks, and until then, cheers. So the fermentation for the porter went relatively well. It took a bit longer to really get down to that final gravity, uh, mainly because it was a lower fermentation temperature. I wasn't totally convinced that 1020 would be the final gravity because it is a relatively high number, but considering the crystal malt additions, considering the higher mash temperature, and considering just how low that fermentation temperature was, I'm not entirely surprised by this, and it, it tasted very good at this point. So after the better part of two weeks, I went ahead, I kegged it, I put it on tap, and uh, it tasted very, very good. So I'm excited to share this with you.
The beer is called Back in Black, after my favorite ACDC song, and it comes in at 6.4% ABV and 35 IBU. So for the appearance of the beard, it's a really dark black character. Um, I suppose maybe it's dark brown, but it really does look black. It looks like a Guinness in the glass. It also has this really nice tan head um, with a really exceptional head retention. The head has phenomenal structure to it and has wonderful lacing and always keeps a layer on the surface. Overall, the appearance of the beer is pretty much exactly as I'd anticipated it would look, uh, and that's definitely a good thing. So now let's go ahead and dive into the aroma. Ooh. <laughs> the aroma of the beer is uh, quite a potent roast aroma uh, with notes of chocolate on it. And there might be a little bit of like a woody note to it, but really it's dominated by the roast and the chocolate character, um, and that's it. So now let's go in for mouthfeel. Okay, so the mouthfeel on this one is definitely somewhere around the medium full character, I would say. Um, it has a softness to it. It is an almost full-bodied beer. It's not as heavy or full as a stout, um, and I would argue not even as, uh, as full as a Guinness, but it is very similar in its construction. The carbonation level is about standard for an American beer, about two and a half volumes of CO2. Uh, which gives it a little bit of a carbonation bite, but nothing really too extreme. Having a lower level of carbonation in there would actually really bring out the level of the body of this beer. Maybe more of a traditional English porter style of uh, serving a beer if I was to do that. Um, but for this American style of porter, a regular standard two and a half volumes of CO2 carbonation level is uh, right on where you want to be. And that gives it that slightly more medium level of uh, drinkability. So there's a few hard edges in the mouthfeel, but for the most part, it's actually relatively soft um, and a lot more gentle than you would expect, I think, uh, but definitely a lot less full feeling than you might expect, especially if you're looking at this from the lens of like a stout or something like that. Uh, so now let's go in for flavor. Mmm. Oh yeah, that's good. <laughs> This is really, really good. It's a very satisfying beer. Um, I love porters. Uh, they're one of the most frequently ordered types of beer for me, especially this time of year. Of course, you know, when it's colder, you want darker, fuller beers. Um, so this is a really satisfying one. One of my favorite beers I've put on tap in a while, actually. So overall, it has a really nice, gentle, soft, approachable roastiness to it. It's nothing like an American stout where you're taking that roastiness several notches up. It's actually even less roasty than a Guinness, uh, to be honest. It's, <laughs> it's a different kind of roast though. So the chocolate malt, the midnight wheat, those bring different things to the table than your regular standard roasted barley would, which is what your standard stouts would incorporate. This is a gentler, more flavorful roast. Roasted barley comes across as more of like a burned, ashy, almost campfire-like roast. When you have it in a Guinness, it actually is soft still, but it has a much more intense character. This chocolate malt is actually coming across with that dark chocolate, coffee-like roast. Um, and that actually gives it some dimensions uh, to be explored in terms of just the roasty flavor alone, but the higher final gravity gives this a little bit of sweetness to back up all of that roast. Take the sharper astringent edges off of it, that also comes from the brewing techniques that I used in this, uh, and really makes this a very balanced and overall uh, approachable pint for somebody who may not necessarily like a roasted malt heavy forward beer like this. When you take out that astringency, that bite from the roasted malts, this actually has a ton of flavor. Um, that is really quite delicious. A little bit of background sweetness in there from the higher final gravity, from that crystal malt that we added, actually uh, lends itself very, very nicely to the overall character of the beer. It allows those roasted flavors to come through as more of their kind of synonymous coffee and chocolate characters as opposed to just sharp bitterness, um, which is exactly what I wanted. There is also a little bit of a yeast contribution to this. 
Um, there is that roundness to the mouthfeel that it added, but there's also a small amount of ester. I am picking up a small amount of a slight fruitiness. Uh, it's really hard to find unless you're actually looking into it and trying to figure out what kind of yeast was used to ferment this. Not as clean as if I'd used an American ale yeast. I said that uh, was that was actually what I was going for. Um, and I think it works pretty well. It does blend in nicely. It has a nice overall character. Um, and in terms of using an English yeast, I think it was actually a very good result. There's a very dark fruit in here almost. Like a, a hint of a date almost. And I think that comes from the caramel malt, but it could come from the yeast as well. And I'm not 100% sure. It works beautifully in this though. Overall, this is really quite nice. It's just this nice expression of the coffee and chocolate notes that I love without the excessive and aggressive uh, burnt character of roasted malts uh, that can happen when you add too many or if you add um, a lot of like roasted barley. And it's also supported very well by the base malts in there. The yeast contributes a very nice character and there's a small amount of a woody note, an earthy note perhaps, from that Willamette. Um, and the overall hop bitterness is balancing the beer out nicely as well. It's not too sweet. It, uh, the sweetness is there to bolster that roasted character, not to make it a sweet beer. Um, everything, remember, in brewing is all about balance. And that's how you have to strike that balance with these aggressively flavored beers. And it's kind of ironic how you can take something like an aggressive hop bitterness in an aggressive roasted character and balance that out with some strong sweetness so that the overall result of the beer is actually a neutral balanced character that allows all the better parts of these flavors to shine. And um, it's the magic of brewing. I love it so much. At about six and a half percent, this is exactly what I would want for the alcohol level on this beer. It's not a one and done Imperial Stout, and it's certainly not a four or five percent session ale either. It's somewhere firmly in the middle, gives it some substantial character, gives it a kick, um, and it lets you, it kind of backs up those stronger flavors as well with a little uh, nice amount of alcohol there. And it's a beer that I would absolutely make again. It's hearty, it's tasty, it's balanced, it's full of flavor. The pH and the water chemistry and the pH ended up exactly in the right spot, and it came out just so approachable. So if you're a home brewer that's looking to explore the category of darker beers, and you or maybe those who drink your beer aren't necessarily huge fans of dark beers, I would recommend trying this out. It's, it's not really a sweet beer like a pastry stout or a lactose stout or something like that, but it comes across far more drinkable, far less alcohol content than those beers. Um, and that's a really nice niche in the, in the styles of beer, I think. So we'll see how this does over time. It's only two weeks old right now and actually really uh, has come into its own in a really nice way. So overall, very happy with the results here. Would absolutely brew this again. As far as potential improvements, I don't really have any um, other than I would just be curious to see how different it would be if I did a side-by-side -side with American yeast versus English yeast. Um, it would probably provide some noticeable differences, uh, both in mouthfeel and overall flavor. But honestly, I'm really not uh, finding anything in here that I want to change or tweak or do anything differently with. Um, I'm very happy with this, especially considering it's been three years since I made a porter last. So um, I'm gonna enjoy this one. I'm gonna savor this one. So anyway, guys, if you enjoyed the video, please don't hesitate to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button as well, and comment down below with your thoughts on the whole experience. If you wanna support the channel, there's a number of different ways to do so, but one of the best, I think, is to go pick up a t-shirt or a merch uh, item of some kind from my merchandise store. you find that down below the description box, but also in the description box. And that way, at least you get something out of the transaction. But if that's not your thing, no worries. I also have a Patreon, and my Patreon supporters are really making huge moves for this channel, making a big difference in the quality of the production and a lot of other things. So I have a big thank you to give to my Patreon supporters. But there's also channel memberships. There's a super thanks button as well if you feel inclined to hit either of those. Those are quicker and easier ways to help me out as well. I appreciate all of it. It means a lot and it all goes right back into this channel. I also have an Amazon store if you're curious about picking up some of the equipment that I use to make beer with or my filming equipment or any of that stuff. Go check that out. That's in the description box as well. If you want to follow me in more than just YouTube, I'm also available on Instagram and Facebook, both as The Apartment Brewer, where you'll see some more frequent content and get some ideas of what's going to potentially be coming to the YouTube channel in the future. And if you're still here, thank you 
Thank you very much for watching all the way to the end of the video. I put a ton of work into these videos, so uh, it, it means a ton to me if you're watching all the way to the end and just actually getting all of that out of it. Um, so thank you if you're still here. It means a lot to me. So this one goes out to you guys, the real MVPs. And until the next one, cheers.